Barbary Wars refers to a series of naval battles fought across two wars by the United States, Sicily and Sweden, against the pirates that were acting out of the Barbary states located in northern Africa. Operating mainly after Tunis, Tripoli, and Algiers, pirates had been capturing ships and raiding cities across the Mediterranean since the mid-1500s. And though the rate of piracy in the Mediterranean Sea had declined by the 19th century, it was at that time that the newly established United States was forced to get involved. Also known as the Barbary Corsairs, the Muslim pirates and privateers had been known to attack British merchant and cargo ships all along the coast of northern Africa ever since the 1600s. Any ship that was captured would see its crew being held captive to either be sold for ransom or to become enslaved. And sadly, it wasn't long before the British had become all too familiar with receiving news that their ships and people had been taken over or destroyed. The piracy didn't cease there, though, and as time went on, any ship that traveled the waters surrounding the Mediterranean was at risk. And during the American Revolutionary War, the pirates got their first taste of American ship. Throughout the 1700s, once the pirates realized that the American ships were no longer being protected by the British Navy, the pirates began attacking and seizing American ships. And since the U.S. had decided to disband its Continental Navy, it had no military force at sea to protect its ships. This led the United States government to reach an agreement in 1786 that resulted in tribute payments being made to the Barbary Corsairs in order to stop the attacks. But the negotiations didn't end there, and over time, the pirates began demanding more and more money with each payment. Finally, on March 20, 1794, George Washington beckoned Congress to vote and authorized the U.S. military to build a fleet consisting of six heavy frigates in order to establish the United States Navy and put an end to the attacks. The request wasn't approved directly, and by 1797, the U.S. had already paid out more than $1.25 million to the Barbary states. Many Americans who knew about these payments resented them and agreed with Washington that the money would be better spent on a naval force. Thomas Jefferson would use this to help his case in the presidential election of 1800. Many historians believe that part of what helped Jefferson beat John Adams in the election was that he claimed to pay such tribute to foreign cruisers was humiliating. And in 1801, just a year after Thomas Jefferson became president, First Barbary War began. Also referred to as the Tripolitan War, it also started when Jefferson refused to pay tribute to the pirates and instead decided to send a naval fleet. The war began on May 13, 1801, after President Jefferson had sent battleships containing gifts that were intended to keep the peace between the U.S. and Tripoli, not knowing that Yusuf Karamanli, the Pasha of Tripoli Tania, had declared war on the U.S. These ships were under the command of Commodore Richard Dale, and just to be safe, Jefferson had given him permission to protect his ships in the case of an attack. And it's a good thing he did this, because by August 1 of that year, the First Barbary War was officially underway. In the beginning, the American ships were largely successful in dealing with the piracy that was occurring along the North African coast. That was until 1803, when the USS Philadelphia and its crew hit a string of bad luck. As the ship was sailing off the coast of Tripoli, creating a blockade, it ended up running aground on a reef that hadn't been charted on any of the maps that were in use. The captain of the ship, Captain William Bainbridge, tried everything he could to refloat the vessel by removing any objects that could be weighing her down, including the Philadelphia's artillery. Captain Bainbridge's plan didn't yield any results, though, and eventually the ship, along with its crew, was captured and enslaved. And though the idea of losing a ship as powerful as the Philadelphia hurt the United States, the idea of the enemy using it against them stung even more. Since there was no chance of the U.S. reclaiming the ship, they saw that their only option would be to destroy it so that it couldn't be used by the Barbary Corsairs. A young Navy lieutenant named Stephen Decatur was put in charge of leading a small group made up of volunteers into Tripoli Harbor to destroy the vessel. They snuck in under the cover of darkness and used a Tripoli fishing vessel that they had captured to covertly make their way to the Philadelphia on the evening of February 16, 1804. 
According to the report, the USS Philadelphia was occupied by a full crew of Tripolitans, but within 10 minutes, Decatur had forced them all off the ship and into the water. The Tripolitans had planned for this scenario, though, and before Decatur could attack, they had positioned the ship in the harbor in the perfect firing range of more than 100 heavy guns that were waiting along the shore for just that very moment. The 10-minute battle on board the USS Philadelphia alerted those in the harbor around the ship of the attack, and before long, the sky was lit up by cannons and gunfire. Chaos ensued, and before long, it was up to Decatur to get the ship that he had used to sail into the harbor, the Intrepid, out of range of the battle. The Intrepid slowly made its way out of the harbor, and despite being fired upon heavily, ended up getting out of range. When the tensions had died down for the lieutenant, he checked on his men and was surprised to see that not a single one had lost their life. In fact, only one had been wounded, and according to the stories, it was only a minor wound. Stephen Decatur quickly rose to military fame, both in the U.S. and around the rest of the world, and he ended up being promoted to captain. On July 14, Edward Preble led a second attack on Tripoli which would end up being known as the Second Battle of Tripoli Harbor with the help of Master Commandant Richard Summers, who was now commanding the Intrepid. This time, however, the Intrepid wouldn't make it out of the battle, sadly. It's not reported exactly what happened to the ship. However, many historians believe that the most likely scenario is that the ship was destroyed by enemy ships. Thomas Jefferson then persuaded Congress to send more ships to the Mediterranean, and Samuel Barron was then placed in charge of an 11-ship fleet used to create a large blockade on Tripoli. America's first definitive win over the Barbary pirates came on April 27, 1805, when a man named William Eaton, who happened to be a former army captain, led a force of eight Marines and 500 mercenaries into a full-scale siege of the city of Derna. The fight became known as the Battle of Derna, and it was the first time in history that American soldiers were able to raise their flag on foreign soil as a sign of their clear and decisive victory. This victory helped the United States finally gain leverage over the Barbary states in order to begin negotiating for American hostages to be returned. Battle of Derna is often referred to as the beginning of the end of the Tripolitan Wars, because by this point in time, Yusuf Karmanali had been showing signs of concern. These signs were directed both toward the blockade that had been placed around Tripoli, but also the rumor that those around him were conspiring to put his brother back in charge. And on June 10, 1805, Jefferson and Carmonelli came to terms settled on a peace deal. The U.S. agreed to pay out $60,000 to Tripoli in exchange for the return of any hostages that had been taken by the pirates. Just like that, the war was over, at least the first part of it. You see, after tensions began brewing between the British and the United States, it wasn't long before the two countries were at war again. Known as the War of 1812, this battle didn't have much to do with the Barbary Wars, except for the fact that it directly led to the second part of it. During the War of 1812, it was discovered that the British Navy had somehow contacted the pirates in Algiers and requested that they begin attacking American ships again. It didn't take much persuasion for the pirates of Algiers to agree, and in no time at all, the threat of Barbary pirates was once again present throughout the Mediterranean Sea. This brings us to the Second Barbary War, which was much shorter than the first one and took place in 1815 after the Barbary pirates began attacking American ships again. At this time, James Madison was holding the position of president, making him the fourth president of the United States. And he, much like Washington and Jefferson, called for Congress to declare war on the Barbary Corsairs, specifically Algiers. Congress was inclined to agree with Madison. They didn't hesitate to send out a fleet of naval ships heading toward Algiers. And can you guess who was commanding them? Stephen Decatur was once again in charge for the second time during the Barbary Wars. Only this time he wasn't a lieutenant and had been promoted all the way up to Commodore. The plan was simple. Madison ordered Decatur to sail to Algiers and attack any ship sailing under their flag, no questions asked. And after leaving from a New York harbor on May 20, 1815, the United States Naval Squadron reached the Mediterranean Sea by June 15. After Decatur's fleet got closer to Algiers, they ended up encountering two Algiers ships, and they did as they were told, attack. 
the U.S. fleet quickly overcame the two Algerine ships and managed to capture their crews. And after killing their commanders, it was time for Decatur to negotiate and shut down all pirate attacks on U.S. ships in the Mediterranean. Later that month, Decatur arrived in Algiers along with the two ships his fleet had captured, and on July 3, 1815, the ruler of Algiers agreed to sign a new treaty. The treaty called for Decatur to return both captured ships, along with the 500 crew members that he had imprisoned. And in return, the Algerians would return all of their American prisoners, along with paying a sum of $10,000 for all the supplies they had stolen in the past. The treaty ensured that American ships would have safe passage across the Mediterranean without having to risk running into or being attacked by pirates. Just to be safe, Decatur took his fleet from Algiers and went directly back to Tunis as well as Tripoli to make sure they too understood the terms of the agreement and that they weren't planning on doing anything that would go against it. And when Decatur finally returned to the U.S. later that year, he was considered a hero among the people and the person who officially put an end to the Barbary Wars. At this point in time, the rest of the world was coming to terms with the fact that the United States had quickly become a force to be reckoned with, firmly established itself among the world's greatest naval forces. That's all for today's video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any more historical videos like this one.